Dr. Needleman, thank you so much for inviting me to your home to talk about your latest book, What is God? You're most welcome. Dr. Needleman, uh, you have an unusual cover to this book. Uh, it's simpler than I expected, but uh, we'll go into that at the very end. Uh, your first sentence in What is God is, To think about God is to the human soul what breathing is to the human body. I thought that was a rather unusual approach to begin to uh, explore the subject of God, but from a philosopher, I suppose that's eminently appropriate. It's a little complicated or not so obvious. For me, when I find that sometimes it takes me a year or two years to find the first sentence of a book, mm -hmm. and when I found the first sentence, I almost consider the book is almost a half done. It's not easy. This particular sentence, which opens the book, I knew I wanted to write a book about God because I try to write books about that try to create a bridge or discover a bridge between the great spiritual teachings of the world and the essence of them, as I understand it, and the concrete, really agonizing problems of our culture. And today, the, one of the most burning questions is, what is God? So the moment I thought of that book, that, I, that would be my next book, this sentence appeared almost like a vision. Most sentences I have to work for at the beginning of that book. I have to work hard, think, write, try, cross out. It's, uh, this one just was given to think about God. Is to the human soul what breathing is to the human body. And it was so appropriate. I just wrote it down because there's a kind of pondering, a kind of thinking, a kind of weighing of ultimate questions, which when you are open in a certain way, when a question like this opens you, your whole state changes and your attention is brought down into your into your soul, into your inner world, and you feel a new vibration, a new life, because you're pondering, you're thinking about a very deep, important question. And the breathing actually changes, like in a, a serious meditation. Mm -hmm. Something happens to some part of you inwardly that is noticeable. Why do you think it's so, this question today is so important? What is God? Why is it particularly important now? Well, obviously, it's always been crucial to mankind, but now with the great terror and the violence associated with it more and more, uh, with the uh, terrorism, with the kind of loud debate, somewhat childish debate that's going on about whether what about between atheists and so-called fundamentalists. It's in, the, it's in our law courts, it's in our politics, it's in our military, it's everywhere now. It's, un, it's a very surprising that <clears throat> this question has become so alive and so big and so important in an era which was supposed to be, uh, God was supposed to be marginalized by science. On the contrary, it's more crucial, more critical than ever. And it's one of the great needs of mankind to have a, a deep, real, nourishing sense of a nourishing question about ultimate reality and the nature of God. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are born needing, needing some understanding of what is above ourselves or what we're part of. Right. I think this question was first brought to your attention, or one of the first times it was brought to your attention in a particularly vivid way. In 1943, when you were nine years old, you were sitting with your father on the porch of your home in Philadelphia, and you looked at the sky, at the stars in the sky, and you write in the book, a current of electricity streaked down your spine as you looked at the stars. And it was a kind of a quiet moment, and you looked at your father, really not wanting to disturb him as he was viewing the stars also, but at one point, he said something that, in some sense, changed your life. Could yeah. you talk to you about this? Uh, we were looking at the sky, and uh, as you say, and um, suddenly, it was summer, and suddenly, 
I, a million stars appeared. I've never seen a sky like that. I don't know what happened, how it happened, because usually the, uh, the summer air, especially, usually covers most of the stars and blankets them out in a way. And it was as though a whole new instrument of seeing appeared. I, and I saw the, all these stars, and I was deeply this energy or whatever it was at that time came down my spine, my back, and I was I was so still and so taken by this this amazing vision. And my father who had been totally silent up to that time. I don't know how he whether he felt something coming from me or what. And as we were both sitting there silently, which we almost never did, <clears throat> he simply said, without even looking at me, he said, that's God. And I, you know, that did change my life. That made me, that was the beginning of some kind of search in my life. It's ironic that with the uh, progress of uh, technology, that the night sky has become dimmed for so many people. Um, what significance do you find in that, that, that we're uh, prevented by our own progress from looking at what amazed the ancients? It's a very good question because there's many aspects to it. Um, symbolically, metaphorically, artificial, the artificially made human light has dimmed the great light of the sky. And this is a huge loss. We need to be able to look at the stars. We need a starry sky in our being. And we're cut off from that. Even now you go into the countryside, mostly in the woods sometimes, and you still, you don't see that many stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, yet when I was a boy, even at that time, you could still have a, a wild sky full of stars uh, mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we are deprived of that now, and it's a big, big starvation, a big loss. But symbolically, as I say, it's so so symbolic that the stars like symbolize or represent great ideas, say, or great teachings or great truths mm -hmm. that come from another level of human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And all we're able now to see and to see things by the light of that great level of understanding is what we desperately need. It's like the the light of great truths that come from a higher level of being, a higher level of consciousness is now been replaced by the light we create through our own thoughts. That's what it represents you know, as a symbol. Mm -hmm. And we really can't live a full life by the concepts that we have of created by our own ordinary state, our own ordinary mind. That's what it symbolizes to me. Why can't we live with, with those concepts? Because they don't point us to what we are meant to be and how we are meant to live. They try to sometimes, but they come more from a superficial part of the mind which only connects words and, and concepts, which doesn't have a direct perception of things as they are in themselves, as reality. Mm -hmm. that, that can only happen in a truly higher state of consciousness that we can see behind the appearances. So we live in a world of surfaces and appearances and what seems to be true, but the world as it is in itself, we are barred from by that uh, screen of what the ancient uh, philosophers called the world of appearances, of illus illusions. Mm -hmm. We live in an illusory world, basically. Right. At the moment when you uh, saw the sky and heard your father say, uh, that is God. You also had what you call in the book an I am moment. Tell us about that I am moment. Everyone has such a moment, or more, more than once I would say, very often, but almost everyone has had these moments in their life, often in childhood, when suddenly for some reason either you're in danger or you're in some great joyous experience or some uh, shock of some kind, or just for a, who knows what reason, or something beautiful, or watching a baby born, where you feel the sense of presence, that I am, I am here, I simply I am. And that is a great moment 
which, uh, which we experience uh, our true, something that points to our true identity as opposed to our egoistic identity. You said uh, to understand what God is demands from the outset the presence in ourselves of what God is. Talk to me about that. That need to understand that vibration that makes us wish and seek ultimate truth as the most important enterprise of our life is itself a form, a special form of energy, as a special form of uh, life force in us that propels. And the question we ask in those moments is like the end result of that energy pouring through us. And that energy is a higher, I don't know if it's God, but it's pointing us to it. So what I say in the book is to really ask that kind of a question. We already have the God element in us. And yet, as we age, we tend to lose this sense of presence in ourselves. Why is that? We are in a world that doesn't have respect for that and which attracts us to other needs, which are legitimate sometimes, other desires, material desires, physical desires, social needs, obligations, fears, desires, all the part of what you might call, not necessarily in a negative sense, but our socially conditioned personality is what takes us more as a what we are, which we start believing in, and we're drawn away from that pure love of truth. Right. You also said um, something that was really rather startling for me when I read it in the book, and that you said our exploring mind is intrinsically atheistic. So if your question is, what is God? that automatically puts you into maybe an atheistic uh, state of mind. And at one point in your life, you became an atheist. Could you tell us how this happened, when this happened? Well, uh, I, I don't think I said our exploring mind. I think our ordinary mind. Ordinary our mind, ordinary yes. Ordinary mind uh, associates thoughts, images based on used largely on sense perception or on hearsay or what someone told us or uh, it doesn't go deep. So our ordinary mind does is, is really at the service of our ego usually. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really know about, it doesn't have any idea, of, it has a concept about God maybe, but it doesn't have an experience of God. The experience of God transcends the ego. So insofar as we are locked into our ordinary conceptual mind, we can't really say we are have a belief in God. And intellectually, maybe, but an intellectual belief is like a belief in a concept or a theory. It's not rooted in an impression, a deep impression, a deep experience of something which is so true, there's no possible way of doubting it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I heard about religion when I was young and growing up, which is uh, a situation shared by millions of people, of millions of us, I was totally put off by it. And I was totally <laughs> allergic to the Judaism that I heard about of my childhood. We were sort of a, ethnically Jewish, but and my grandparents were very orth orthodox. And but around my house, Judaism was more like a social and ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. And going into the synagogues and hearing what it said there just never connected with me. I, I had wanted nothing to do with it. But nature, nature was my God. The stars, the, the woods, the, the Wissahickon Creek in Philadelphia, the, all that, that was God enough for me. And, uh, I was an atheist when I got old enough to start thinking in philosophical terms. And in my late teens, I said to myself, yes, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in this God stuff. It was all a fairy tale. I believe Freud. Freud said it was all an illusion of mankind based on fear. But now that we have science, we don't need that. So I became an atheist and wanted nothing to do with religion. And yet at this time, you still had this uh, sense of inquiry. You still had this question in your mind. You read books on Zen, and you read D.T. Suzuki's books. And I think at one point, you... Uh, became so passionately involved in some questions that you had that you actually had an interview with him. I did indeed. 
And that was a changing point in your life. Tell us about it. Well, uh, I had uh, my first year in graduate school uh, philosophy. I lived in, it was at Yale at New Haven. Um, I was not interested at all in religion, but I had in my senior year at college been very interested in Zen Buddhism, which presented itself as not a religion. And it wasn't, as far as the language is concerned, it was a language of psychology in a very deep and special sense, a language that was more more psychological, even scientific in a certain sense of the word, uh, and yet totally confounding ordinary rationality. It was that Zen was just coming into the culture in 1956. And so it was wondrously paradoxical and yet deeply interesting, deeply interesting to me. And I had started then getting also interested in the teaching of Gurdjieff, which was not religious at all, was not presented that way. And I, and my interest in Zen had taken me to the book of T.T. Suzuki, edited by William Barrett, called Zen Buddhism, which had such an influence. And I went, I was, had the chance, I heard that he was in New York. Somebody told me about it. I one way or the other, I was granted an interview with him. And I had written my master, my thesis as an undergraduate in senior year on the question, what is the self? I was highly sophisticated philosophically. I had all kinds of arguments, all kinds of authorities. Uh, I really knew all about it. I had Kant, I had Heidegger, I had Kierkegaard, I was Nietzsche, I was an expert on what is the self. Ah, what a question, what a great question I had. So you met D.T. Suzuki. Suzuki, who, I, who was this author, the author of Zen Buddhism, uh -huh. and, uh, and said many things paradoxical and profound about the self. I had all these ideas and philosophy in me. I was ready for giants, so I got to meet him. I was sitting in the waiting room waiting to meet him. I was nervous and yet I was going to show him. You were ready for Dharma combat. I was ready for Dharma combat or something of that kind anyhow. And I just, I went I read all these books so I thought I knew a lot. And I simply met this man of quiet, small, slight, unassuming presence, wonderful presence with these eyebrows that came out. And I put my question to him. Well, Dr. He, Suzuki, what is the self? Uh, and he just looked at me and he said, who is asking the question? <laughs> now that's a typical Zen answer I learned and I should have known, but I, I didn't know it, but it was not, it dumbfounded me. What that meaning? What did it, could it mean? Who was asking the question? I was shocked and, uh, and annoyed. I was annoyed at well. I said, I'm asking the question. You know, in order. And he said, simply, show me this I. And I just shut me down. Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Hegel, philosophy, Plato, they all ran away. I was sitting there and I was practically insulted by it. And I was very disappointed. I went away disappointed from that. It was such a, of course, I should have known that these questions, that's what a Zen man does. And three months later, I sat bolt upright in bed, realizing what a great gift he had given me by not giving me a mental answer, but to make me digest it, ponder it, move in my being. It woke me up in the middle of the night and I said, that's it. It's my state of open questioning at that point was the answer, not in words, but in experience. And I felt a great wave of joy and appreciation that he loved he loved something in me and gave me the respect of not answering me in some philosophical way that would have tied up the question in my mind mm -hmm. rather than opened me to an experience. Yeah. But you never saw him again? No, he died shortly after that. Uh -huh. I think this was maybe a year before he died. How did you feel when you found out that he died? Well, I am no, no, sad, but I no, I didn't feel him. He was my, going to be my teacher forever. I knew I wouldn't be able to, to see him much, but what does one feel when a great man who's helped you dies? You feel kind of grief and gratitude. But Do you I wish that you had thanked him? I think 
somewhere in the Buddha realm. <laughs> he, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would say that. Another Suzuki, Suzuki Roshi. Shunru Suzuki. Yes. He, she, Shunru Suzuki, whom I met several times and interviewed and talked to when I was writing my book on the new religions. Um, <clears throat> the book was published a couple of years ago, uh, little sayings of his. Mm -hmm. I think to one corner of the world or something like that. And uh, someone, he had cancer at that point and he knew he was dying. And he said a wonderful thing to one of his pupils. It's quoted in that book. He said, uh, don't worry about me. I know who I am. And I said, well, isn't that a beautiful thing to say about death? Mm -hmm. We'll come to that later. So Suzuki, D.T. Suzuki, also knew who he was. And mm -hmm. therefore, he didn't need my gratitude. Right. I was a student at uh, Zen Center after, long after Suzuki Roshi died, and I heard uh, many stories uh, about him and felt sad that I never actually met him. What did it feel like to be in his presence? Well, since meeting him in the 1960s and before that too, I had met many men, several, not many, but several men of great presence in, from the Gurdjieff work, and so I had a real feeling of what it is to have a person who has a higher level of being than I. Mm -hmm. And I felt in his presence, like I, a little bit like I felt with people of that kind, I felt quiet and deeply in touch with something in myself that could be someday like them without any kind of arrogance or pride or anything. When you're in the presence of a person with presence, you yourself become present. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about the Zen Center at that time? 19... At, at the organization that grew around him? Well, at that time, it was before all the storm and drang with, uh, came later. It was just beginning. And uh, it was in a synagogue, an old synagogue, which was always ironic to me how much of the Zen Center, Zen people were occupying synagogues and Jewish buildings mm -hmm. as though they were taking the place. Right. And, uh, My I've... experience is that so many people who study Zen are Jewish. Yeah. Why is that? Do you think? Well, it is spirituality without being religious, without religiosity. Mm -hmm. And like, like myself, many Jewish friends, people, uh, young people especially, have been gr grown up sometimes in an atmosphere where there was very little real spirituality, but a lot of ethnic and rules and rituals and language and things about religion that they couldn't give themselves to. But they still had a spiritual, a, a, a deep wish in their being for something they couldn't name. And mm -hmm. Zen, can, Zen can touch that mm -hmm. without at all provoking the, uh, the religious allergies that we've all, so, much, so many of us have grown up with. Do you think there's something in the Jewish soul and the Jewish psyche that uh, yearns for meaning, that uh, um, yeah, that yearns for meaning in life, that, that 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 seeks out questions such as what is God, or or what is spirituality? I don't say it's particularly Jewish. I think it's in every human being. Mm -hmm. This yearning, this need. Um, I think the, the intellectual sophistication of Zen may be particularly appealing to Jewish young men who tend to go into academic studies and, mm -hmm. and tend to be intellectual and ethically activist mm -hmm. and uh, that there's very, for many of those days, anyway, for many Jewish young people, uh, there's not that much sense of transcendence in the Jewish practice, in the Jewish teaching, the Jewish religion. And whereas in Catholicism, come of Christianity, even with, although that too has become somewhat secularized, um, there still is a degree of transcendence being spoken of. But when you, when you go to many Jewish things, uh, synagogues, you don't find it. You spoke, find it sometimes spoken of, but it isn't really communicated. At least it wasn't for, for me. Right. You got a teaching job um, at San Francisco State, 
college. Um, you taught the history of Western religious thought, and you got this job around the time that there was a spiritual revolution brewing in in San Francisco. You were at, you were at the epicenter of this, and at the same time, when you got this job, some of the uh, religious thought, if I can put it that way, kind of put you off, and so you found yourself in a position where you had to teach something that really kind of repulsed you, but yet at the same time, in familiarizing yourself with it, you became attracted to it. So can you talk to us about that? Yes, well, you've just summed it up quite huh. well. <laughs> no, I came to, I had this job and, and in philosophy department, which is fine, mm -hmm. but I was required to teach one course, a whole year course in the history of Western religious thought. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did my honorable best, which I tried to do it, because although I was the, turned it off, I could never have imagined that I'd be teaching it course in Judaism, which I had ran away from, and even more uh, unimaginable to me was to be teaching a course about Christianity, which frightened me. Not only did I mm -hmm. feel repelled by it, but I was a little frightened by Christianity from what I experienced of it as a young person. Did you feel somehow inauthentic? Attempting no, to t no, not no? inauthentic, because I felt I had a job to do as a professor as an academic, and I would do a good job. And I read and read and read. I said, well, I never would have chosen this. I never would have imagined I'd be teaching this. And so, but nevertheless, I will do a good job. So I started reading and studying and reading about Judaism and Christianity, and I discovered this is much deeper and much more alive than I could have imagined. All my education as a young person in the best universities in the country Nobody, or at least I, was not ever made aware that there was such depth, intellectually sophisticated depth to the Christian and the Jewish tradition. So I started teaching it for one or two, three years, and the more I taught it, the more I came to appreciate it as a philosopher, as a student of ideas, and as, as a human, as something that satisfied an authentic human need. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say I became a believer, but I did come to respect the religions that as a child I had run away from. And then, at just about that time, after a few years here, five or six years here, then the, in San Francisco became the magnet for all the new religious movements that started coming in from Asia. And that interested me also very much, particularly the Zen Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Did you ever encounter uh, students in the process of teaching who had, who you felt had authentic mystical experiences? I imagine people would be attracted to this course who may have been moved by uh, the spirit in their life. Well, I had a lot of suspicious, I had a sense of suspiciousness about so-called mystical experiences for many years, and still do for some of them. Mm -hmm. Tell so us about I that. I never really gave much weight to the students who came with, with that. <clears throat> No doubt some of them had something authentic, but I was not turned toward that. It was only later in my life, as I taught more and more and practiced my own path more and more, that I saw that there was something that some of them may have experienced. And now I'm quite, I hope to try to be much more sensitive that some students have real experiences of that kind and some don't. But I remember <clears throat> one young woman came to me when I was who had, was a, about oh, 19 years old or something, and we had been reading St. Augustine. And she was part of the following of the uh, Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, in the Transcendental Meditation. And she came up to me and said, I'm pitying poor St. Augustine because he will work so hard to experience anything like God when there's all they had, to, they understood all you had to do was sit for 20 minutes every, twice a day, and you would reach God. And I said, you know, come on. <laughs> this, this, this was the dark side <laughs> of, of the New Age movement. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, people, some of the people did touch something very real. You couldn't dismiss it all. But there was a lot of gullibility yeah, also. there was a lot of gullibility. A lot of pretension and... Pretension, gullibility, 
worse than government, worse than pretension there was on the hand part of some of the gurus' uh, exploitation and uh, really some kind of destructive brainwashing of a, of a certain kind. One day in class, uh, a student uh, waited for all the other uh, classmates to leave, and he handed you a book uh, about Gurdjieff. Yes. Uh, was that your first introduction to Gurdjieff? No, I had met with the Gurdjieff teaching when I was a graduate student at, at Yale, and I even was studying it personally, but I didn't stay with it. And um, so I had, had some years I had was, was away from it, and he came up to me and he put the book in my, he asked me if I wanted to I read this book, it was called Our Life with Mr. Gurdjieff by Thomas de Hartmann. I said, well, I know all of, I, I, had, I had myself the feeling that I was tempted to say I know all about it, you know, and I, I was no longer involved with it. But he was so earnest that I took it home and it sat on my desk for a couple of weeks and I picked it up one night and I was deeply touched by it and I started realizing there was something in this teaching that I hadn't seen and that became a very important uh, part of my life. How did you pursue it from there? Well, it was uh, this young man who presented it to me was part of a community of people who were studying that teaching mm -hmm. under the guidance of someone who had been a pupil of Gurdjieff, a man named John Pentland. And uh, I started getting interested in meeting these people. And after some months of meeting with some of them to talk about it, not wanting to rush into anything, uh, I had the chance to meet this man and in his presence I realized this was an, a man of great authenticity and inner force and understanding. How did it feel to be in his presence? Intensely alive with a kind of sense of another level of human perception, a kind of what someone once called a, a little bit of a sacred fear. I didn't know what, I certainly wasn't afraid of anything ordinary. But maybe I, looking back, I was maybe a little bit afraid that I would lose my ordinary sense of identity in a way, I don't know what it was, but a sense of, a deep sense of, homecoming, that, huh, this is perhaps what I've been looking for all my life, mm -hmm. and without knowing it. And how did you feel about the other people in the group as they related to each other and as they related to uh, uh, Mr. Pentland? They all had a deep respect for him without being slavish. That was the most important thing I think came out. They had a deep respect and a deep uh, love for him mm -hmm. without any sense of slavish or herd mentality or brainwashing or anything. They were all right. highly individual, in one sense, normal people. Of course, at this time, being in the epicenter of the uh, uh, New Age movement, uh, New Age spirituality, you were keenly aware of just how susceptible to spell people can be. Yes. Uh, so you must have been looking out for that. I was, but I didn't see any anything like that. Mm -hmm. This was only contrary. That we used to. Um, I came to the point of defining the difference between a. This is kind of half of a joke, but between a cult and a genuine spiritual path, and the difference, is, as I say, it's two paths. But the difference would be a a cult is very easy to get into, but very hard to get out of. Uh -huh. But a real spiritual path of awakening is hard to get into, but very easy, all too easy to leave. In other words, you have to really want it. Uh, Dr. Needleman, you also became interested in uh, Gnosticism in this time. What attracted you to uh, Gnosticism? First of all, what is Gnosticism and, and why were you attracted to it? Gnosticism is a term applied to uh, uh, an array of spiritual, religious teachings and religions around the time of Christ or a little bit before and after um, 
But the roots of the word Gnosticism is a gnosis, the word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which is the Greek term for knowledge. And it means really, it means in the spiritual, religious, traditional sense, a, a quality of knowledge that transforms you, that is intimately related with the transformation of consciousness. Of a, uh, and therefore, it's something which is not specifically to those what are Gnostic sects, which are what usually is meant by Gnosticism. Uh, they were, uh, for a long time, they were considered by scholars as sort of an aberration and by Christian theologians as a heresy and because they have much bizarre-sounding language and bizarre-sounding teachings and they seemed at the very best to stress knowing rather than faith, which was a heretical idea for the Christian teacher. And uh, it turns out, of course, that they were persecuted, their texts are burned, they were, uh, we had very little direct accounts of their life, their work, and some of them certainly sounded a little peculiar, but, and I took a, I studied them a little bit in, at college, and I had some, a brilliant professor who started interpreting them in a certain way, but later, uh, when I started reading about Gnosticism as part of preparing for this course on history of Western religious thought, I was amazed to find they echoed something which I had been so touched by in the Gurdjieff teaching, uh, this idea that there is such a thing as transformational knowledge, a new kind of knowing that's not just our, like our, the knowledge that we call knowledge in scientific era. It, there really was such a thing as a higher kind of knowledge, and I began to understand the symbolism in what they were speaking of, mm -hmm. and uh, this one, and then Elaine Pagels and a few others started writing about the Gnostics in a way that helped us to see that they really were, and some of them, a very profound and deeply spiritual. Um, how does the Gurdjieff work allow you to get in touch with this state? In your book, you mentioned special conditions, I think, and I immediately wondered, I wonder what those special conditions are. Is this uh, something that's private to the teaching, or, or is it something you can talk about? Well, just one of the most important aspects of special conditions is to be surrounded by men and women whose main aim is to wake up to their true nature not to make money, not to have pleasure, not all those things are very important in our ordinary life. But insofar as where there's a community of people helping each other in some way by their attitude, that is about that is probably the chief aspect of these kind of special conditions. Mm -hmm. That a shared aim which is very uncommon in the life we ordinarily lead when the motivations and aims are not at all that way. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself an atheist now? No, not at all. I understand the Gurdjieff teaching does not stress the word God so much. And uh, in your book, Toward the End, um, you made some kind of, I don't know what word to call it, uh, some kind of opening. Uh, you actually uh, made a point that atheists might, in fact, be on the right path, for by excluding the concept of God, they have a, uh, they've, in essence, removed themselves of some baggage that prevents them from understanding what true religion or true spirituality or God is. Have I, perhaps you can say it better. It's a very good, good question, and it's a very interesting thing. That... Because we're in a, in a world now where um, evolutionary biologists in their study of biology are coming to conclusions there is no such thing as God without having really examined what consciousness is. Right, right. I asked one of these uh, so-called experts what is consciousness? He couldn't define it and he couldn't specifically say what relationship if any consciousness had to evolution. Um, I also asked him what, uh, what uh, value 
um, altruism, uh, if altruism had any relationship with evolution, he said, in his opinion, altruism, doing good to strangers, was a misfire of evolution. So when you combine these two things together, kind of a, a lack of exploration of consciousness and uh, a basic diminution of goodness, uh, not so good. What's your question? Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry if I rambled. Not at all. Uh, well, atheism just seems to be on, on the rise, and, and there, well, al along with it, there's not so much of a, a focus on the question, what is consciousness? Right. Well, uh, atheists may not look at it this way, the famous, the publicized atheists, but right. they could be understood as providing a useful uh, purg purgation of illusions about God. Mm -hmm. And that's a very precious thing to do, is to get, help people free themselves of superstition and self-indulgent illusions, sentimental fantasies, which can be uh, latch on and fuel egoism, selfishness, even violence. Huh. So if they can get help people get rid of their uh, illusions about God, and not necessarily take away from people the deep source of hope and help that their feeling for God brings. Mm -hmm. In other words, if they can take away what is uh, destructive in people's belief of God, that's a very precious service. And I, I, t I try to look at them that way. If that's all they do, and if they try to, if they try to destroy people's faith, and get rid of their faith, and they have nothing to put in its place, that's a very dangerous and a very uh, contemptible thing to do. Right. If you take a if you take a man's religion away from him, and you don't give something in its place, you have done a great harm. So I don't think they put anything in their place, but I'm not trying to say that they, I'm trying to treat it as a service that they can, for example, at a higher, deeper level, when the greatest mystic of the Christian tradition, or one of the great ones, Meister Eckhart, says things like, I pray to God that he free me of God. What does he mean? He means, I pray to God that he help me separate from my own thinking that puts a conceptual form on something and therefore prevents me from directly experiencing the truth about it. So I pray to God that he free me of my own thinking about God because that's bound to be uh, or very ordinary. And so that's a sacred task, is to help take away illusions. But unless the other hand is giving something in its place, then it is uh, to be, not to be affirmed at all. So I try to say that in the book, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you clarified what I mangled for you. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a good point. And if I was, what is consciousness? No, nobody has defined it. You only know it when you have it. They can't define it. But to reduce it to uh, selfish or, or, or animalistic motives, no, no insult to animals, but to reduce that, all these refined human qualities of ethics and altruism and, and, and search for truth, to reduce it to just the survival, physical survival mechanisms, is to, is to take away the uniquely human element in us. And that is what I consider one of the toxic ideas of our culture, just as toxic as violent fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. um, in your book, uh, uh, specifically talking about the, the Gurdjieff group, you mentioned that uh, God needs awakened men for God's justice to be in the world. Awakened men and women, of course. Men and women, of yeah. course, yes. Yes, we. This, it's may be that <clears throat> Freud had this very powerful statement about uh, religion being an illusion that people went to because they couldn't, they were afraid, and therefore he felt that people should uh, divest themselves of this illusion and believe in science. I think that it, Freud was a great man, but that, that where he went a little off there. But the real illusion is that people feel that God can act in the world of human affairs in with only ordinary people who are not 
developed according to how they're meant to be. So in that sense, it's awakened human beings which are needed for God to God to act in the world. That's the way you're putting it in a short form. It's one of the proofs for the existence of God, I would say, as a philosopher who has studied a lot of the proofs for the existence of God. This may not sound like much of a proof, but one of the great proofs for the existence of God is the existence of men and women who are inhabited by what you like to call God. So people who manifest the existence of God yes. in themselves. Yes. I read that one quote in your book and I found that profoundly uh, moving. The direct quote here is the proof of the existence of God is the existence of people who manifest God. Yeah. I th so oftentimes I think we, when we see injustice, we, you know, we ask God, why did you allow this to happen? But the onus is on us. Yes, us. it's on us. We have to develop. Yeah, we have to develop. Unfortunately, someone, somehow, there are said people who are developed enough to help us. If we are looking, they're going to find us. That's what my my faith, my hope is there. There do exist awakened people who can help, and we're seeing more of them appear in our culture now. Not just people who are followers of Gurdjieff, but other people, Buddhists and other teachings. And of course, there are the usual share of of uh, inauthentic things, and we have to be critical. It can't be gullible, but on the other hand, we have to also be open because there are people out there who do have something to offer in that respect. Mm -hmm. We do have within us another quality of mind which is there waiting to enter our life, and we do have moments of experience where we experience this higher mind from that involves the heart and the body as well, and those moments appear and then we, at that moment, we know that th this is in me. We are that way. That's what we are meant to be in touch with in our everyday life. And these moments are telling us, I am you. Let me into your life. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the, the mind may, our attention may be narrowed down to deal with the practicalities of life, but there's nothing intrinsically in our makeup that, that compels us to forget all, of, to lose all contact with this bigger mind while we're exercising the little mind. The little mind can be exercised and still be in touch with the big mind. That would be the purpose of a spiritual discipline, is to make that more common, more possible in our life. Um, Dr. Needleman, um, you've written a, a beautiful book that is both simple and complex and it has uh, nuances in it that uh, I just discovered on the second reading. I'd like to go back to the very beginning when uh, as a child of nine years old you were with your father on the porch looking at the clear starry night sky and uh, I'd like to put it in the context of the age we live in now, where uh, the progress of science, the progress of technology has actually obscured the uh, clarity of the vision of that night sky. So with that analogy, I'd like you to give us some uh, concluding words. I would say There is so much danger at the present time with everybody, which everyone can recognize, obviously, with the weapons that exist, with the ethical failure that is becoming more visible, with the destruction of the environment that everyone is aware of, uh, with the toxic ideas that are reducing our sense of what we are meant to be and affecting our children uh, with the art that circulates around, sometimes in forms of music or, or other kinds of visual things the, that I 
actually suppress the inner metaphysical faith that a man, a human being, is meant to be something much more than we think. Uh, these reductive things that you spoke about, this teachings of scientism, which is not the same as science, uh, the fundamental, the extreme fundamentalism that <clears throat> threatens people's uh, capacity to think for themselves. So on one hand you have scientism, which in a way denies one way or the other, seems to deny the possible evolution of human consciousness in a real sense, that denies the spirit in us, that puts it down, that makes us feel that we're just complicated animals with a super computer on our brain, and the other side that denies, that suppresses the impulse toward independent thought, which is the real heart of science at its best. So those two things, scientism and extreme uh, dogmatism of another kind, those are two things we, that are dangerous. Now, there's also something uh, growing, some search that's appearing more and more in the Western world, anyhow, and in the modern world in general. Not necessarily institutional religion, but spirituality, which has some kind of vague meaning sometimes, but has a very precise meaning, really. This yearning, this search to awaken, to understand, to have truth, to, to have faith, to believe, to work, to believe, to become what one is meant to become, whether it's a Christian, Buddhist, whether it's in the Gurdjieff work, whether it's whatever. And that's a hope. With a little of that at work on this earth, that could change the time. Uh, I like to think more, not that the old world is being overwhelmed by dangerous influences, but that there is a balance between forces for awakening and forces of, of uh, suppression of the human essence. Two forces that are work on the planet. Forces of awakening to what we are meant to be and forces that are holding us down and in violence and in and certain belief systems. I like to think that, that there's a delicate balance there and that it's a tipping point, right? not, a, not an onrushing current of destruction, but a tipping point. And with just a moderate amount of awakened human beings entering the world, that could tip it toward survival and maybe the possibility of developing something beneficent for the world. If it doesn't happen, it could tip it the other way and then we are really in seriously close to the end of our culture at the moment. So one works to awaken, whether whatever tradition, whatever where it is, not just for oneself, but for the earth, but for the world. And I think it's possible. That tipping point it gives me hope because we know in our individual life, like one great experience can change our whole being, like the near-death experience you're interested in. So maybe it is on the earth too that just a, a relatively small number of conscious men and women can really change the tide, can really turn the, turn the earth, can really help the earth. That's what I would say my closing point. Okay, well, Dr. Needleman, on that uh, point of hope, I'd like to thank you so much for having me here for this uh, wonderful interview. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to meet you <laughs> and talk with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much.